when I went to build my first boat, I found a bandsaw that was being used in an auto wrecking yard to cut up dog bones. I traded an old printing machine and $250 for this saw, which I then had to rebuild. But it built my boat. It survived, good golly, 20 years at Baird Boat Company, and then it came home with me and, and it's built an awful lot of stuff here. I think sometimes it cuts to a line when I'm distracted and not as good as I should be. I've always doubted my ability to enter the craft world, I think because I feel like I started very late in my life. I just didn't do anything mechanical as a child. I didn't take anything apart, put it back together. My parents were teachers, my grandparents were teachers. It was kind of expected going on to that sort of thing. The Marine trades in Port Townsend grew out of an amazing combination of talent, wonderfully good fortune, public support, and tapping into the revenue stream generated by the fisheries in the Gulf of Alaska. Ultimately, we became 20% of the county's economy. We have rigging, sail making, canvas work, detail as far as varnish, painting, etc. boat yards, we have machine shops, welding shops, we have a foundry, we have wood import yards to fix everything. Education, marinas, gosh, what am I missing? Probably more, but that's what comes to my mind. <laughs> my name is Ernie Baird. I went to work in the marine trades in Port Townsend in 1979 and have continued to be engaged with the marine trades in Port Townsend since. I'm Carolyn Corbin. I'm a student at the Northwest School of Wooden Boat Building here in Port Hadlock. And for the last five years, I've been sailing on tall ships and working in shipyards on the East Coast. As a kid, I had a really great childhood. We were always exploring things. We were always getting invested and learning about something. I loved being near the water, and I was always painting the water, and I was always drawing the water and drawing the boats that I saw. I grew up a mile in from the shore of Lake Michigan, which, in terms of your sensory perception, kind of counts as an ocean. Nobody expected that I would wind up making my living with my hands. My father was an insurance executive. My mother, uh, a microbiologist. I entered college in 1965. Times were turbulent. By 1970, I had been deferred by my draft board as a conscientious objector to war, started drinking quite a bit, and turning myself into sort of an experimental uh, pharmaceutical project for a while. And that started to resolve when I came to Port Townsend. Success, I think, is a really hard thing for me to talk about uh, because I was taught that success is like financial stability and the American dream. In college, I took an archaeology tract and focused my archaeology work on people that worked near the water in maritime history. In the summers between my college semesters, I worked at a living history museum, taking care of their replica tall ship, working with the captain and the shipwright of that boat to maintain the boat, sail the boat, and to do education. So I had this pressure to you know, perform academically in college, but what I was really enjoying was these summers that I was just continuing to return to. When I came to town in 77, the marine trades were in their infancy. I think I knew I found my craft the first boat I worked on at Port Townsend Boat Works. I just find the shapes compellingly beautiful. And the people with whom I went to work, the combination of talent and brains and, and heart was uh, enough that even if I hadn't cared so much for the work, I think I might very well have stayed for the company. I took a student trip with Sea Education Association, a sailing scientific platform, and it was amazing. We sailed it. We participated in the maintenance of the ship. We participated in the engineering side, the navigation side, the whole lot. It completely changed my perspective on what I wanted to do. I'd been studying archeology, span which was interesting, but it was still very removed from life. I found myself frustrated by the amount of paperwork and writing about or researching about or speculating about something that I had never done. And the people who I was reading who wrote on this also had never done. And when I like actually started sailing this boat, it just felt like all of a sudden I was in one of those books that I had read as a kid. 
I was doing the things. Then I took a position aboard the schooner The Pride of Baltimore II, which is a ship that I'd grown up watching. She's a serious machine. It is not an easy boat to sail. It definitely takes a crew of 10 people working really well together. In four months, we did 8,000 nautical miles. When I was sailing these harder boats, it's that extra level of like understanding that something exists, but then understanding how it works, but then being the person who takes responsibility to make it work. It's almost like the step into being an adult. The reason Port Townsend was a port of entry was that Port Townsend could accommodate an ocean-going, cargo-carrying, sailing vessel a very deep draft vessel close along shore. That made the construction of wharves and docks much more efficient. This area has always had a close connection to ships and support of ships. It's a really rich boat building tradition out here, uh, one that I'd never experienced being an East Coaster. People can really work hard and make a living here. I also see a lot of young people working in the yard, which is really exciting. Um, because it means that there's a continuance of knowledge, but also it's open to people who are trying to make a career. Our early work was substantially among boats that, that fished in southeast Alaska in the salmon fishery. In 1979, Japanese vessels were excluded from that fishery. So the Japanese went from being fisher people in the Gulf of Alaska to people buying the product. The Japanese requirements for quality were much more stringent than the American market. And so part of what happened in Port Townsend was the refitting of boats to be able to put the fish in a hold flooded with refrigerated seawater that kept them from degrading. Similar kinds of improvements just rippled right through the fleet. I started to step away from sailing into more of the maintenance side of things. I had done a, an apprenticeship with a shipwright from Maine. Tony Finicaro is the gentleman's name. When I started to pursue a craft, it just felt very refreshing. It felt very honest. The people who were engaging in this, who were telling it, were telling it from experience. It didn't seem like a major life change, but working with Tony really did. Again, it was just somebody that just gave me a chance and believed in me. There was just this expectation of you work and you work and you work until you get it right. You, didn't, you weren't judged for getting it wrong the first time. The job wasn't taken away from you if you didn't do it right. Eventually, in order to uh, go through all the steps necessary to understand the design requirements for a wooden boat and the structural elements within it, I built a boat myself. In an effort to earn enough money to build a much larger boat than my first, I left my employment at Mark's place and started a competing business one block down the road. To his everlasting credit, when I told him I was going to do this, he looked at me and said he understood. He urged me simply to do good work, saying that as long as Port Townsend had a good name, there would be enough work to go around for everybody. I came from a background that started out very equal. The tall ship crews are often made up of more women than men. And so as a deckhand, I very much felt, you know, just one of everybody else. My experience changed when I stepped up to being a leader because all of a sudden I was dealing with a much different power dynamic. I was younger and one of the few female voices in a largely older male conversation. I had to think extra hard about how I was presenting myself to be hurt, to be taken seriously. There are absolutely times when I wonder, like, if I had just stood up and said something, even if it got me a bad performance review, would it have made it so that next woman didn't have to, like, sit down and just take it? But I also think that it's getting better. I think it is getting better. And I think that this town is very positive to be a woman in the workplace. Building boats is a wonderful way to spend time. Running a business is, is a bit more trying. Having started with $40,000 worth of assets, I was $40,000 in debt by the beginning of the next year. And we just worked like crazy. 
I almost never invited my employees up one by one to give them an account of how I felt about what they were doing and how they were doing it, or give them at the same time a chance to tell me how they felt about working as a business. And I didn't have the intelligence or the imagination to introduce the practice at my place. And I think things might very well have gone better if I had been listening some of the time when I was otherwise talking. I can remember a day when the crew was twisting a plank and it was three inch thick plank and quite a bit of twist. I had to put down my pen and go downstairs and say, I'd really like to hang that plank. And I did just because it was so much fun. For me, the obsession is like the tools and the technology and like the puzzle of the way some of the joints fit together. The idea of like all this stress coming in, compression and then tension, that I can work with that for the rest of my life is awesome. As for Boathaven, in the mid-60s, the Army Corps of Engineers dredged a significant extension of the uh, boat basin and built a rock breakwater. The spoils from that dredging created 17 acres of fill at the mouth of Kai Tai Lagoon. It created a really fertile place for folks who had enough skills and enough initiative to work on a shoestring to start to try to tap the market that was generated by having a place to, to moor those boats and haul them out. By the mid-90s, it became clear that, that we would either start doing a whole lot more work on yachts or we'd have to fold up. What we wanted was a 300-ton lift, but we couldn't get the port commissioners to agree to it. The swing vote was Fred Epstein. I took it upon myself to approach the port executive director of, what the heck is wrong with Fred? This, this thing makes so much sense and, and we're losing business. He said, Fred doesn't want the taxpayer to carry you guys. He gave me a figure. I went to each of the large shops and asked them what they thought they could do, gross sales, if we had access to boats with a 300-ton lift. I went back to the port executive director and said, we'll agree to pay a 3% surcharge on all the work we do pulled by a 300-ton lift. That got Fred to agree. That revenue bond was a 25-year commitment for the port. In the last year, the marine trades contribution was $100,000. In my view, we did our share. You see a situation where initial public investment created an opportunity for private enterprise to get started. It certainly is a kind of synergy. It worked extremely well. Hi everybody, it's Carolyn here. I'm at the boat building school and uh, I thought you'd give you guys a little tour with the phone. We're looking at my current project I'm working at with some other students. It's the backbones of an Abaco dinghy. If you look at this, the way this bat interacts with this frame, and you look at the way this bat interacts with that frame, you can see that all the angles accept the plank really nicely. The instructors at the school, they're incredibly supportive and they understand, I think, that what people are looking for when they come to the Northwest School Wooden Boat Building is just time and space to figure it out. Down here, covered in batons, uh, you see the lofting. We spent two months and drew the entire boat. So right there, we've got the stern post and frame O coming out. You've got that same image just reversed. You've got the stern post and then frame O. This is a craft that is both something I can do professionally to make money, but it's also something that reminds me to like work on myself every day and be patient with myself. By 2004, the business had been successful enough that the mortgage on the buildings was retired and the mortgage on my home was retired. That said, the days were long and the days of the week were numerous. It wasn't doing my marriage any good at all. 
Likewise, I was getting on and my crew was beginning to look at me and, and ask, what will we do when you retire? Some of those people had been with me quite a long time and I felt that beyond the hourly compensation that was already in their pocket, they really deserved some of the equity that had been built in the shop. Six people agreed to form a cooperative and take up the management of the business. And they formed Haven Boatworks. I moved here when I was 30 years old. I'm 73 now. I just caught a really good break. I wandered into this event that was happening without me in Port Townsend and found a place that, that suited me extremely well. Chip! <laughs> Hi, my name's Ernie. I live at the south end of the island, and ah. I've known your dad for about a million years. What will foster the continued success of the trades in the port is the willingness to be of service to the markets that we serve now. We just don't know what's next. In some cases, it's a new material or a new way of doing things. In other cases, it's the observation that our practices are, are having a deleterious effect on the world and we need to correct our behavior. We've adjusted to changes in the fisheries, changes within the port, changes within the regulatory environment. We keep making adjustments so that we are worthy participants in the world. As far as I can tell, what it takes to be successful is to find a way to put one's natural inclination into harness in such a way that it's of use and of interest to other people. Not giving up is absolutely necessary. It may or may not be sufficient. More recently, I've started to redefine success for myself as like, am I enjoying what I'm doing? Some of the most laid back people are some of the most successful people because they're just doing what they are focusing on. They seem happy and enthused about what they're doing. The shape of this lead is designed to fit right under the boat to conform with the nice, fair shape of the hull. I would like to find a space where I can have a home and have that home be open to other people. I really enjoy like bringing people through my life and hopefully they can stay a little while. If you get involved with other people, the people with whom you work, possibly forming a family or a committed relationship, to be an honorable conservator of all those obligations and still find something that just makes you smile every time, every once in a while while you're doing it. That's an amazing piece of good fortune. My grandfather was an incredibly talented metal worker and woodworker, and most of my tools come from him. But he would never have ever dreamed of teaching me how to use any of them. Not because so much I was a girl, but because I was supposed to be better. I was supposed to not work with my hands. I find it particularly gratifying that the industry that we started to put together in the late 70s continues to be useful to the generation that follows us. I'm glad they've been able to pick up our tools and adapt them to the uses that are, that are needed now. Having a job where at the end of the day, you can always do your best work every day because you can always make everything slightly better. It's just simply about like, did I do a good job today? Yes. I did a good day's work. That's what I needed to do. 